Welcome to the Interesting Lawyers Podcast. I'm your host, Russ Adler, and I'm here at the Podcast Junkies Studio in Boca Raton, Florida. Today's guest is a very special friend and a really unique and interesting lawyer. You know, a lot of lawyers do really well as trial lawyers, and they go on to become rock stars. Today's guest, Rick Block, was actually a rock star before he became a trial lawyer. So Rick graduated from Nova Law School in, I think, about 1985. He then yep. spent six years uh, in a rock and roll band, on the road, touring, literally being a rock star. And then when he decided to go into practice, and according to the bio, and I'm reading from the bio that Rick sent me, he literally could not get a job due to his wild reputation that he had created playing music. So he opened a solo practice the law offices of Eric S. Block and ran that for 27 years. And that's my guest today, Rick Block. Thank you so much for joining me today. Say hello to our audience. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here, Russ. It's always good to see you, my friend. Thank you. Um, what an interesting story. So well, before- it would be, that would be very, very cool if it were true. Uh, I'm, I'm actually was never a real rock star. I, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. Uh, with that title, I did play rock and roll music for six years out of law school, uh, sowing some very wild oats, and I, I will uh, be happy to share some of those stories with you. But uh, I, I don't like to say that I was some big rock star like uh, the people whom I, whom I admire so much. But I did. That is true. I did play music for a living for six years once I finished uh, law school. At Nova. Well, they even have drinks called rock star. But in my mind, Rick, you've always been a rock star. And according to the uh, lawyers I know... Uh, who, and we talk about you frequently, uh, you're also a rock star, and that's because of the other part of the story where you've tried about 400 cases, about 200 of those cases, you've gotten excess verdicts, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, but yeah. you, you have this way of getting huge verdicts in cases when the insurance companies just don't want to pay. And I've been told by a lot of defense attorneys I know that you are a particular and very unique challenge. You're very difficult uh, you're unmanageable for, from their point of view. Uh, you really take control of the courtroom as if you're on stage in some kind of rock concert. So let me begin by asking you this. Um, your background as a rock star or as a rock musician, you toured for about six years, you said? Yes. After law school. Correct. So, Correct. So, I got out of law school in Fort Lauderdale in 85 and started performing back in Jacksonville, Florida, with, which is where I went to high school with some of my old high school buddies. And, and that was home base. It's all that we did tour around uh, and for about six and a half years. So what possessed you now? You graduate law school, you get this law degree, and most other people would try to find a job at a law firm. How is it that you ended up touring for six years with a rock band? Well, it was, you know, it's one of those things that you can't make it up and you can't uh, design it. It was never by design. My law, my roommate in high school, uh, I, I went to a private high school and we played, you know, box guitars and sang and we weren't any good. And we were uh, dreamed someday of one day being on stage and playing one night uh, would have been a great thing. Well, when I came back to Jacksonville, he had actually... While I was away at Florida and at Nova, he was uh, working as a musician and started uh, uh, solo acting around. So I started singing with him and that then turned into, because we were in Jacksonville, we knew a lot of the Leonard Skinner and 38 special guys and they started to come hang out. Next thing you knew, we became, a, so it, it just kind of developed on its own. And it was a while, you know, again, if I could have done it for six weeks, my wildest dreams would have been, uh, would have been met. And it ended up being six years. So it just it just kind of happened. What a ride. You know, in my research, I came across this guy. He was the lead guitarist for Molly Hatchet. And after that career, he went on to become a lawyer himself. I'm going to try to track him down and have him on. But Yeah, uh, uh, we, we actually went to junior high school together, and his name is Bobby Ingram. Right. I tell him I said hello. He knows me well. I'm going to reach out to him on LinkedIn. I found him on there. I thought he was really interesting. Um, but, I actually also represent... Uh, the well, I don't know if that'll help you or not, but I represent a guy named Bobby Caps, who's the uh, uh, um, keyboard player for 38 Special. And if that may help you get to to um, uh, Bobby Ingram, that may be well. And also, I played music with a guy named Timmy Smith, 
who is the bass player for Molly Hatch. So he knows me very, very well as well. And if that can help get Bobby on for you, be sure to say I said hello. Yeah, you can help. Hook me up, Rick. Okay. Hook me up, baby. Happy to do it. So let's get back to you. So okay. you, you tour, you do the music thing for six years, and then you have, by your own description, a wild reputation that literally um, prevented you from getting employment. So can you get a little more into depth about what yeah, you mean by got, having a wild reputation? <laughs> I got lost in all, you know, all the, the, the slang, temper, uh, 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 boilerplate type uh, language about being sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's all true, and it all happened to me, and it was a dream that I thought would never happen to me, and the excesses happened to me. Uh, and um, I, I, this is also back technologically, musically where they had just started with remote uh, amps, uh, remote uh, pickups for your guitar and remote uh, 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 microphones. So I started dancing on bar tops and going out in the audience and, you know, having a big time. And, and uh, again, because I was known to use a, a substance or two back in those days, um, that always helped with the performance end of it. And so I ended up with this uh, in the rock and roll business, it was a great reputation, but when it came try when it came time to grow up and get a real job in terms of uh, representing people's interests and in courts of law, it's a much different dynamic and a much different demographic. And what used to work for me, uh, became an absolute impediment to my being able to be employed anywhere. So it was either get a job, you know, working as a carpenter somewhere, which nothing wrong with that, but I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, or uh, hang out my own shingle and learn how to practice law and learn how to do it right or die. So necessity being the mother of invention, uh, I learned how to become a lawyer. And even though you didn't make millions as a uh, rock star or a musician, you mm -hmm. certainly got so many multi-million dollar verdicts in cases where the insurance companies frequently wouldn't even offer close to one million. So... Before we get into that, Rick, can you tell our listeners how your experience uh, as a musician playing rock and roll, touring the United States and wherever else you toured, how did that translate into your courtroom skills and presence? Because you are one formidable dude, according to everyone ah, I ask. Thank you. Uh, just tell my mom, um, who, by the way, God bless her, is 91 and still with us. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. Hi, so Mom. Uh, thanks, Russ. So uh, the truth of the matter is I'm not smart enough to, to have known that all of that was going to, to fit together like a jigsaw puzzle, but it did. And when you think about it, it makes sense. So when you're the lead singer in a rock and roll band, you know, you introduce songs, you're talking to people who don't talk back, just like in a courtroom, you're talking to six people who don't talk back, usually seven with an alternate or maybe eight depending on how long the trial is. Uh, but so that dynamic I got used to and got comfortable with, and I have played the most people that I have played in front of is 3,000 people in one gig at one night. Um, and so six people, eight people in a box became a day at the beach. And so there's that dynamic. There's also the dynamic of timing. There's also the dynamic of inflection. There's also the dynamic of word choice, and sometimes, believe it, this is a hard thing for a hard thing for lawyers to understand. Sometimes, just shutting the fuck up and not saying anything can make your point much more strongly than anything that you could you could have to say. When you're talking about somebody's pain, very often I'll talk to the jury in closing and say, "Let's let's consider Mr. Smith's pain for the next thirty seconds. Ready? Go." That was five seconds. And it makes a point, uh, especially when you let RSA say, let's do it for a minute and let it go for 30 seconds. Courtroom time, it just makes it all, it, it, uh, it multiplies the effect of everything. It's an eternity, so yeah. Those dramatic things playing music. Yeah, but your choice of words, the whole performative aspect, that's something I always speak to my clients about who are getting ready to try cases. You know, knowing the evidence... Knowing it cold, knowing your file, 
knowing your witnesses, having a strategy. It's all very important. But at the end of the day, the jury, is, the jury wants to see a performance. So is that something that you think about every time that you appear before them? Yes, a, bit, a great deal. And that's a great question because it's a hard line to draw. You don't want to be uh, for, I'll give you a great example. One of the things they, they teach for good reason in, in every trial advocacy, advocacy course is never be funny, never use humor in the courtroom. I use it all the time. Two reasons. Number one, I'm really a funny guy. Uh, but seriously, the truth of the matter is I, I try all of my humor is directed at me being the butt of the joke. And jurors love that. They love the fact that I don't take myself so seriously and that uh, you know there is uh, there there are other things and that are important in this world other than me, and so uh, humor can be used in the right place. Again, you got to be careful because the reason the law schools don't teach or teach you not to do that is because if it's done in the in the wrong manner, it can be seen or interpreted as making light of your client's plight, and so it can never be about that. It has to be about you. But in the end of my jury selection, one of the things I always say is. Are any of you sitting there thinking, is there any, you know, is there, is this dumb lawyer going to ask me this obvious question before he sits down? And they laugh and they like the fact that I'm not taking myself, you know, too seriously. So there's that aspect of it. There, there's the aspect of, of uh, you know, when you're cross-examination, you got to be, when you're cross-examining their doctors, you got to be aggressive and you got to let them know that the, you got to let the jurors know they're being manipulated and this guy's a liar. But you can't, you've got to be creative in the way that you go about that, or they end up feeling sorry for that guy being attacked. And a lot of the of the defense lawyers, no, I shouldn't say a lot, but I have seen a few defense lawyers who will use that as a tactic and say, well, you're hurting my feelings. Uh, and, and of course, we get into that. Really, your feelings are being hurt at, at $10,000 an hour um, just because I'm asking you uh, uh, common sense questions. Um, so it, it all goes to, uh, it is a performance there. I had this conversation with a lawyer the other day. You have to learn what works for you. Some lawyers get dressed up in a, in a, in a striped coat with a, with plaid pants and an ugly ass tie. Cause they don't want, they want to be seen as a member, uh, as a regular guy. I think that jurors want to see spit and polish. I wear uh, uh, nice suits and I wear nice ties and I wear nice uh, polished shoes. I don't wear my expensive jewelry. I don't wear a ridiculous watch, but I do wear and I, I think jurors expect us to look the part. And so I play the part and I, and, and, and yet at the same time, you have to be careful because there's a line over which you do not want to cross, cross with all of these aspects of the fact you're exactly right, Russ. It is performance it just is and the bottom line is if they like you better than they like the other lawyer uh that's always a good thing and do you think that's been the case in your trials where you just literally knocked it out of the park with your verdict i will say this and i hate that you asked me that question because i promised you i would give you truthful answers the truthful answer is this i have i don't know where 150 200 excess verdicts i have a ton of multi multi-million dollar verdicts. And I will say this, the vast majority of my multi-million dollar verdicts are a result of my simply exploiting how much the defense has offended the common sense of the, of the jury. It's more of a, a, it's much more a product of my taking advantage and exploiting the defense and, and, and how, ridiculous they are and how insulting to the intelligence they can be as opposed to anything brilliant that I did. So I was going to ask you about the defense because it's really a great contrast. You know, whenever you try a case, obviously on the other side of the coin, the other side of the courtroom, there's one, two, three or more defense lawyers. And obviously understanding the defense, you know, I've had some great defense lawyers on here on the show, and I, I really try to be even-handed about it. But obviously, they have a different master to serve, and that's the insurance companies. Often Correct. conservative people, there's expectations that they dress conservatively. They try not to 
make a whole statement or have a large personality like you do. So can you sum it up for us, Rick, all the cases that you've tried, the jury trials, tell us about the contrast between you and your large personality, even though you're not wearing the big blingy gold watch you're wearing now, but right. you and your big personality and the words, obviously you're connecting with them. How, how does the defense receive you? How do the defense attorneys react to you? Uh, usually, and, and that, gosh, you're asking me, I hate that you're asking me these great questions because I'm afraid they may see this, but that's my job. Usually they, they do the worst thing possible, which is they read from their script. Look, what am I good at? I'm good at talking to people. And I tell all of my young lawyers that I'm to that, you know, we are, I'm now senior trial counsel uh, at Morgan and Morgan, which is the largest personal injury law firm in the world. So I mentor a great many young lawyers. And one of the things that I tell them is talk to your, your jurors, talk to your witnesses. When jury selection, my jury selection is anywhere from three to four hours, depending, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, but I'm talking to them. I want to know how they feel. I'm never going to embarrass them. I'm never going to try to change their mind. I want to know how they feel and why. That's it's their business. They've earned their opinions. I just need, in doing my job, I need to let them know that it's my job to, to understand how they feel about these issues. In talking with jurors, um, that I've had a lot of jurors, and I'm sorry, excuse me, I've had a lot of lawyers that have come to watch me try cases in my direct examination. Uh, and I know, Russ, uh, you know all about this. Um, um, from your experience, but in, in, in our direct examination, if we don't know the questions and the colloquy that we need to have with our witnesses, then we shouldn't be up there. So my, all of my, I've done a two and a half hour direct, direct examination with a surgeon going through all of the anatomy, going through explaining all of what discs are and annular tears and all of those things and not had one question written down because it's dumb to be looking at my you know, checking off. I know lawyers that even check off their questions. It's terrible. It's scripted rather than having a colloquy that the jury understands, can follow and believe. And yet that's not what uh, uh, defense lawyers do. Defense lawyers will get up and they will have their, well, isn't it true that, you know, you've worked and, and they just look so terribly stiff and unrelatable. And I, I just think at the end of the day, jurors, just if it was a popularity contest, and and I, I remind every juror in every closing, it's not a popularity contest, but guess what? It is, and that's part of it. How, how do you keep a jury awake for two and a half hours on direct examination? I always focused on brevity, getting done with a treater in under an hour on direct, but just to keep them awake for two and a half hours is an art unto itself. How'd you do that? Well, first of all, you're right. And, and with a treater, once they get the anatomy, they don't need two and a half hours. But that first medical witness has to be, uh, a, whether it's a radiologist or a surgeon or a physiatrist, or, or even I've even done it with chiropractors, they have to teach the anatomy. These jurors are being, and I'm going to give you my dirty, dirty little secret, don't let me forget on, on uh, redirect examination. But in direct examination, we are shoveling information at these people who really want to get it. They really want to understand why there are three, three pain generators to, an, to a herniated disc. They want to know what's the difference between a herniated disc and, uh, and an extruded disc. They want to know what is a herniated disc. They've all heard of MRIs, but they don't know what. So that two and a half hours is actually pretty interesting stuff to them. Now, I am like all lawyers, I'm, I'm a watcher of my jury, and at the at the minute I see somebody starting to nod off or or whatever, then it's time to make a noise, or it's time to ask for a break, or I have to go to the bathroom, or you know there are several different things that can happen. But certainly, you got to keep an eye on your jury and make sure you're not losing them. But the truth of the matter is, because they really want to get it right, um, they're paying attention to all of that 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 medicine that is very, very heady stuff for, for those. I remember, you know, I was not comfortable with the medicine as a practicing personal injury lawyer, probably until I had practiced for five years or more, because it just took that long for me to get it. So that's why it's important to, to not, I never use the word prior and subsequent, because there's jurors that don't understand that that means before and after. 
Here's a, can I tell a quick trial question? Sure, uh, story? please. So one of my first, I was a young lawyer, one of my first multi-million dollar verdicts. And I was outside the Jacksonville courthouse waiting to be picked up. And in Florida, if the, if a juror, if the case is over and a juror approaches you, you can talk to them, but you're not allowed to approach the juror. Well, right. I'm about 15 feet away from a juror on my jury and I can see him turning and looking at me and he's wanting to come over, but I can't motion him over and I'm, I'm hoping they don't come over because I'm dying to know what they thought. And after about 15 seconds, which again, seems like an hour and a half, he finally makes his way over to me and he says, Mr. Block, is it okay if I talk to you? And I said, yes, as long as you understand, I'm not approaching you. You're, I'm allowed to answer any questions you may have. What can I do for you? And he said, well, we really liked you. Obviously we awarded over a million dollars and, and uh, we really, really liked your client, but we did have one question in deliberations. And can I ask you about that? And I said, sure, well, if I can answer it, uh, what's the question? He goes, what's a plaintiff? <laughs> and I said, oh my God, I just tried a week long case. And these people just awarded over a million dollars to somebody that they never got that the plaintiff was the guy sitting next to me. And so that gave me very early on, gave me an understanding. Now, are all jurors that unsophisticated? No. Sometimes you get, and we'll talk about that when you want to, uh, really sophisticated jurors, and, and, and it's a whole different colloquy. But you got to remember, you can't talk over their heads. And that's why I believe the most underrated part of any jury trial is redirect. And here's why. In direct examination, I'm shoveling information at whether it's a, a liability witness or an, or an accident reconstructionist or a biomechanist or a radiologist or a whatever, fill in the blank. These are not people with whom the jurors interact every day like we do. So I'm trying to explain them and look at lots and lots of analogies. Analogies are king. They understand analogies. So when you sit down and direct after direct, the jury's going, okay, I'm kind of with you. I get it. It's making sense. And then the defense gets up and they start asking about um, the, the medicine and those kinds of things. Uh, and, and so a good expert, number one, is going to repeat in cross-examination what they've ta taught in direct examination. But more than that, the defense will only show part of the medical record. They can't help themselves or they're only going to show one one part of a ask one part of a question that was taken in deposition and not give the whole answer under the rule of completeness. And so the point is, when the defense lawyer sits down after cross, now the jury's gone, well, lawyer boy, block, Mr. Big Time, not so sure that you have all the credibility. So now in redirect, I get to show how everything that they just said is bullshit. And I get to put up the medical records. I get to put the medical records up on the Elmo or the screen that I know, Russ, you know all about. And let's look at what you don't have to believe me. I would never suggest that a juror not believe me, but you don't have to. Here's the medical record. Let's read what it says and let's read what he didn't say to you. Right. And that's what I'm telling you. They they resent that shit. They know it. They you know, It's our job to show how it happens and redirect. And now they're not only understanding the medicine and better, but they're understanding the concepts of how they are bastardized and manipulated to be something that's not the truth. Interesting. Going back to that juror outside the Jacksonville courthouse, he probably thought he was yeah. giving all that money to you. I, I, I don't And you were the plaintiff. But the truth of the matter, Russ, is it was so long ago, I don't remember my response, but I remember being in shock and understanding that all of these lawyers who I've seen them, I've seen some of the best appellate lawyers that I've ever seen in the United States uh, in trial, and they're terrible. They're terrible trial because they're talking over the heads of the jurors. I get down and dirty, and I get in the trenches with the jurors, and I don't take myself too seriously. And when I ask doctors to explain, I, I ask them to explain to us, me putting myself in that jury box, explain to us what is meant by a pain generator. Not, not that I'm so impressed with myself to let you know how much I, it's ain't about how much I know. It's about letting the jury know how really legitimately hurt my client is for the rest of their lives. And it's only going to get worse every day until they die all through no fault of their own. Well, it sounds it like it's, 
you it, tell us? It sounds like you've been doing something right because I know that uh, that first 27 years when you went into solo practice because nobody would hire you, uh, you got hit verdicts for seven point seven million for a knee case. There's another one here for fourteen million. But I know that there was a whole litany of these ver- so many multi million dollar verdicts that you actually became known for, as the guy who who would get all of these multi million dollar verdicts. So I well, take it that you got a lot of cases not just from injured people but also from lawyers who wanted to bring you into their cases and involve you. True. As a matter of fact, when, when I I became a Morgan and Morgan lawyer on June, oh, excuse me, January first of 2018, and until that time, I I had spent 27 years right, as a sole practitioner, or having one or two uh, um, uh, younger lawyers working for me as associates. But that's it. And so until I came to Morgan and Morgan, probably 85 percent of my cases were or trials were cases from other lawyers that wanted me to come in and try a case with them. The vast majority of my cases were cases from other lawyers. And candidly, really, that when John Morgan hired me as uh, a senior count, trial counsel there, along with Keith Mitnick and Brian McLean, that's that's what we do is we try the cases that are worked up through other lawyers. So I kind of became the guy that the other lawyers came to. And then obviously, once I started winning some bigger verdicts, the word got out on the street, and I would certainly get my own clients. But by far, it was more uh, coming from other lawyers. So about six years ago, uh, John Morgan approached you, came to you, and asked you to be, even though they're the lar- they're now the largest uh, personal injury firm First, but- in the world, not just in the United States, in the world, you ended up being the, one of their top three senior trial lawyers. And that's correct. That's what John Morgan worked out with you, right? Correct. Well, my first thought is that John Morgan is a genius. I've asked you to see if he could join me on a podcast to tell his story, which is really an incredible one, uh, especially about and how I've made that commitment. And John, I'm going to be asking you. So get ready. Perfect. You can make a clip and send it to him. So sure. I take it they probably have tens of thousands of cases there. They probably have quite the portfolio of cases that you get to try. So what's that like overall? How's that been working out? Well, uh, it's it's interesting that you would ask. There was a time where I went from just kind of having my own pod, like all of the other lawyers, to being taken, having all of that taken away and going right from courtroom to courtroom to courtroom. Um, uh, candidly, at, at this point in my career, June 8th, I'll be 68. Uh, and having had over 400 trials, you know, I really don't have it in me to try uh, the no property damage case anymore, although I've won millions of dollars. I've uh, been very, very fortunate on low property damage cases, and there's ways that they need to be tried. And actually, this morning, I was working for two hours on how to do jury selection in a case where there's very, very little property damage and showing the difference between property damage to a vehicle and personal injury to an occupant, uh, two completely different things. But the point is, is that it has been a, a um, process like anything else, and I am now very, very pleased uh, with the amount of work that I'm doing with Morgan and Morgan and how good they are to me uh, and let me do what I do. Uh, I work very hard and I think it's important as you do too, Russ. Uh, it's important for the younger lawyers who are going to take our place and in my situation sooner than yours, but um, uh, uh, the, the younger lawyers know how to do it correctly and there is a correct way to do it and there is a way that works better. Uh, And, you know, does my way, let me say this to you. I used to give a a seminar every year when I was fishing for cases before I became a Morgan & Morgan lawyer, where, by the way, there's over a quarter of a million cases pending right now. I mean, it's it's just unbelievable. When I came from my practice, I had 350 cases and thought that was a lot. It is a lot Uh, for a solo. Now it's a quarter of a million. It's just a whole different, it's a whole different concept. but uh, the, the, the point is that there's just a way. Uh, uh, so I used to give these seminar called Anatomy of a, of a Jury Trial. It was a one day uh, trial and I did, did Florida Bar, gave CLE credits. And I would give away, quote, my secrets during this. And I was the only speaker uh, for the seven or eight hours. And I would give away my secrets of how this stuff is really done. And every once in a while, I would have a friend 
because it wasn't my canned answer. I would be a little bit more uh, humble than this. But every once once in a while, somebody like you, who was a personal friend, would ask me, "Why are you giving away your secrets? You know, why are you telling them?" And my answer was, "Because they can't do it like I do it. Um, nobody can be Rick Block, but Rick Block. I can't be. Uh, 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 I can't be Russ. Okay. It's it's just that you know we can't be anything that we, uh, other than that." And then who we are. So my techniques will work for other lawyers, but they but they have to put their own spin. Um, so I'll never be Russell Adler. I can never do a podcast like you do a podcast, um, but I can take what you teach me and make it my own. And uh, that's that's what I've tried to do for the last thirty years. Candidly, I want to be Rick Block. So I'm a little <laughs> heartbroken that I can't. Or maybe I can, uh, and then I wake up. Well, that, that's that's awful nice of you to say, but I uh, and you know what? As a human being, uh, I've got my. I've, I told you, you know, I didn't start practicing law till I was thirty three. I didn't get sober till I was thirty three. The Florida bar wouldn't let me practice, and rightfully so, until I got sober. And I I was addicted to alcohol. I was addicted to drugs. Uh, I've been through. Um, the, I have two sons, and uh, I got. I became a single dad when they were five and seven because their mom had an issue. And when they were 14 and 16, she committed suicide. Uh, and, and so we have, you know, we're just like anybody else. We have our, our, our crap on our wall and we have to live life with the heartbreaks and the tragedies and thank God the successes. And I've been very, very blessed. And I've been smart enough uh, to learn from the stuff that I screw up. Yeah, Rick, you seem to have a real way with juries, especially when it comes to the issue of the non-economic damages, the damages for pain, suffering, mental anguish, loss of enjoyment of life, and so forth. The medical bills are the medical bills. The future medicals are the future medicals. I know that you're very good at recovering those monies for your deserving clients. But I also know that you've received some monstrous verdicts consistently in the millions of dollars for these non-economic damages, these human damages, as they're often referred to by trial lawyers. So can you visit with our listeners uh, where that comes from, how you do that? Because yes. that's a real art unto itself as well. Yes, and it's an absolute, in my opinion, and you know what? This just goes to show you. So we, another senior trial lawyer at Morgan Morgan is named, is named Keith Mitnick, and he's my hero. You would think that we're very competitive, like lawyers are and all that. We are not. We, because there's so much work at Morgan and Morgan, we have more than we could ever do. Uh, we don't have to worry about that. I am Keith Mitnick's biggest fan, and he is mine. I steal from him all the time. He steals from me. But the important part is not money. Ready. You're talking about material, yeah. right? I'm talking about I'm talking about strategy. All right, just and clearing the, that up. The best example is this business of the non-economic damages because he doesn't do it like I do it, but he does it in a way that works for him. I don't understand how it can work for him, because the way I've done it, I've done it since day one, and that is this. Starting in jury selection, it's very important that we let our potential jurors understand that pain is what you feel, and that these are all going to be on the same line of the verdict form, but they're different categories of damage, and the first category is, is pain, and that's what you feel, and does everybody under, nobody has a problem with that, and we're talking about in the past, since the crash, and in the future, meaning forever, right? And that can add up into millions of dollars, which I can't tell you right now because it's jury selection and I can't try my case in jury selection. That, that's what the facts are. But do you understand the issue of pain being uh, its own specific category? Yeah. All right, let's talk about mental anguish. Completely different. That's how you feel. That mental uh, pain is what you feel. Mental anguish is how you feel. Uh, sadness, fear of the future, anger, bitterness, all of those kinds of things. Um, and that's a different category, again, in the past and in the future. And the evidence may be always do both sides, always be reasonable, okay? They're going to like you for it. So the evidence on that may be zero. If we don't meet our burden of proof on any of these categories, but right now we're talking about mental anguish, if we don't meet our burden of proof by the greater weight of the evidence, how much will you award? Zero, right? And they all look at me like I'm crazy. You're getting us to commit to award zero. Yeah, if I don't prove my case, 
But there's four types of evidence, folks. There's no evidence. There's some evidence. There's the greater weight of the evidence. And there's the only evidence. And we're going to talk about that at, in opening statement because the only evidence is going to be that, he, that, that there is mental anger. No one is going to uh, um, dispute that Mr. Client has mental anguish, and he's going to describe it for you. And I've talked about all of that in jury selection. And, I'm let, sorry. and let me no take a, and let me take a guess. While you're doing this, the defense attorney is sitting there grinding their teeth at counsel oh, table. Hey, hey. You've already taken away their big point, which is that if there's no evidence or not enough evidence, the jury promises to give them zero. So I know you take that away from them as part of your overwhelming presentation. And they will say, you know, all of these things are the same. No, they're not. Actually, my only, it's weird, I've been doing this 34 years with all these trials. I've only been in front of the Florida Supreme Court one time. And it's a case called Wald versus Granger. And one of the issues was that each, each, each category of non-economic damage, pain and suffering, mental anguish, loss of enjoyment of life, physical impairment, inconvenience, aggravation of a pre-existing condition, and significant scarring are all separate and unique, and they all rise and fall on their own. To make this short for you, Russ, um, I get into each category and give examples and show how each, each one is different, and each may be zero, and each may be $10 million, just that category. And I, one of the questions I ask is, would any of you be tempted to reduce any of the other categories because one of the categories turns out to be so high? Again, I can't tell you what the evidence is until opening statement. But does anybody have an – and so that's the last thing I do before I sit down is let them understand that each – there's seven categories. And here's the great story about that, Russell. So what is the defense ex excuse for – you know, they always say it's a temporary sprain strain, and then it's all due to this pre-existing degenerative condition, right? Yep. That's an aggravation of a pre-existing condition. Well, guess what? Under the seven categories of uh, non-economic damages, the last one is the aggravation of a pre-existing condition. We don't agree that there was a pre-existing condition to be aggravated by their negligence, but that's what they're saying, folks. So if you believe them, that's a whole separate category of money that we're entitled to. Thank you very much, defense. Fascinating. And I know how well that has worked for you. Do you do you ask for a separate line on the verdict form for each of those categories of the non-economic damages? I know that at least in no, Florida, no. they're lumped I together. Just what I do do in my first closing, I used to do, I did do the thing that everything every lawyer does, and I think it's a mistake that every lawyer makes. If you have a two-hour closing or an hour and a half closing, you do, let's just say it's an hour and a half. You do an hour and 20 minutes in your first closing, and then you save 10 minutes for rebuttal. I do it exactly the opposite. I do the math at minimum wage. Who is going, what reasonable person is going to say um, uh, that Russell Adler's uh, pain and suffering is only worth $12 an hour? If you were to see that in a help wanted ad, what person would what reasonable human being would answer that ad at 12? So we know it's worth more than minimum wage, right? You decide how much, but we know that minimum wage or less would be an injustice, right? And that's just for that category. So again, it, it's going to be, the we talk about the past, we talk about the future. The judge is going to tell you, and they, they will, and not, the judge is not going to tell you, the judge is going to instruct you that there is no precise formula that we that you have to use in determining these human damages. However, I'm telling you now, spoiler alert, we are going to present these uh, this evidence. You can't just pick it out of thin air, right? Does everybody agree with that? And the jurors, the Venari will agree with that. Yes, you can't, it's gotta be based on the evidence. Okay, we're gonna present evidence by the hour. I can't ask you to commit are you going to award that uh, damage by the hour or not? But what I can ask you, is there anybody who would have a hard time accepting, at least considering that as a basis for non-economic damages? And everybody will agree to do that. Now, what do they do, Russell, in, in the defense? They never give a basis. They just say, oh, we think it should be $50,000. 
Well, guess what? In my rubber, here we go again and redirect and rebuttal. I get to back up and say, you know what? At the beginning of this trial, I seem to remember some folks saying that you have to base it on evidence. You can't just pick these numbers out of thin air. You know who said that? You did. Did you mean it? We're going to find out with your verdicts. We believed you then and we believe you now. Rick, you're, you're very compelling. You're very smooth. You sound so good that I want to give you money, even though I'm not on the jury and we're not trying the case right Russell, now. I am not too proud to take it, my friend, so I'm let sure. me know where to move. I'm sure. <laughs> so um, I just want to touch on one area that you have gravitated to, and it's one of the most challenging areas for lawyers. And it's also one of the hardest things to prove, and that's the brain injury cases. Can you briefly tell our listeners why you are attracted to these brain injury cases? I know you lecture nationally uh, about them, and what's the deal with these brain injury cases in you? All right, a couple of things. First of all, um, uh, Dorothy Clay Sims, who's a dear friend, probably know, has forgotten more about brain injury litigation than I'll ever know. But she got me involved. I got her involved in one of my first brain injury cases, and I learned a couple of things. Number one, we know so precious little about the brain. Uh, for instance, we know about CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. That's what kills football players. And it's not diagnosed until post-mortem. Why? Because it doesn't show up on an MRI. So they always point to these clean brain MRIs. Or that doesn't, I had a Harvard educated radiologist who specialized in brain injury testify that, and he only tested, he, he was not a retained expert. He was a treating doctor only. He never worked in his life as a retained expert. So he, you know, he couldn't be attacked as being, uh, uh, having an agenda. And he said uh, that 85% um, of legitimately brain injured people suffering from a traumatic brain injury will test negative on all imaging studies. So they're just not competent. Uh, to be able to predict brain injury. Number two, I saw the movie, a great movie with uh, Will Smith, uh, 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 Concussion. And it let me know how little we understood about, uh, uh, we used to think that you had to hit your head on something to have a brain injury. You don't. With, now it, it, we know that it can be a uh, 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 whiplash type motion in the, in the brain can cause that. We used to think you had to lose consciousness for a traumatic brain injury. You don't. We used to think that there had to be a Glasgow coma scale of less than 15. There doesn't. We used to think all of these things about brain injuries, and we were dead wrong. They are, they are much more pervasive. Uh, one of the things that I teach is don't ever, ever, ever hire a neuropsych. There are really great lawyers that disagree with me on this, but I, I think they are the defense is always going to hire a neuropsych. And, and for and let me interrupt. And for the benefit of our listeners, you're referring to neuropsychologists who are specialized psychologists who give testing to look for traces or evidence of brain injury or brain damage in this testing that they administer, right? Or or faking such. Or faking and such. They, and that's what they hire. They've always seemed to find the neuropsychs. Now again, they're not medical doctors. They can't treat brain injuries. They they give testing. They give psychological testing, and it's ridiculous. If you look at the questions on the MMPI-2, do you like reading magazines? Okay, it, it like uh, no matter what, how you answer that, supposedly you have a brain injury or not. One of the questions, and, and I, Dorothy taught me this, that one of the questions they ask is, is your eyesight worse over the last 30 days? If you answer yes, then they mark you down as a faker or a malingerer, even if it's true. So what I do, I, these, these clown, now there are good, very, very good neuropsychologists. But the point is if I hire a neuropsychologist and the defense hires a neuropsychologist, now it's a matter of which neuropsychologist do you believe? If I don't hire one and bring in on rebuttal, which I always want to end on rebuttal, I want to show why they're full of shit and what they just looked at you in the eye, jury, and told you it's just not true. I'm going to prove that the neuropsych is full of crap with a neurologist MD. Um, and so once I learned all of these things and how uh, brain injuries are really, really ruining people's lives and, and lawyers don't, doctors don't understand a lot about them, much less lawyers. 
um, it's the new it's the new opportunity to get true justice for people that have been horribly injured. And we're talking about our brain. We're talking about our our ability to think and our ability to interact with others and stay in a successful marriage and and raise our children appropriately. And I mean, this is really, really important stuff. And we're just scratching the surface. I know it's, they're, it's, they're incredibly difficult to prove, but how is it that you're able to bring home these monster verdicts in brain injury cases consistently uh, in all across the United States? I know that you've tried cases in a lot of states. So how do you do it? All right, sacketators. Remember I told you that's coming up in a minute. I want to tell that story. Oh, the sacketator story. Go ahead. No, we'll, we'll do that in a minute. First, let's talk about brain injury cases. So I had a case, and my client, before the injury, ran four uh, furniture stores. And his stores won best sales, best safety, least injuries, blah, 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 blah. He gets really crunched. The lawyer brings, it's, great, it's a great story, because the lawyer brings him to me to try his case as a neck injury case, right? And so I'm working with the client on explaining to the jury, uh, tell him about your pain. What's it like? And he's just, well, Mr. Block, it's kind of like the, and it just was not working. I tried humor. I tried loving on him. I tried yelling at him. This guy just, and finally I realized, duh, dumb me. I finally realized this guy's got a brain injury. We need to, to uh, continue the trial and work up a brain injury. And we ended up getting four and a half million, four and a half million dollars for him on a case that we never even knew had a brain injury. And listen to this. Before, I'm not that much of a fan of before and after witnesses on normal cases because they're so self-serving. But in brain injury cases, they're, they're priceless. So in this particular case, I told you at the time of the crash, he was uh, he had run four furniture stores. At the time of the trial, I'm going to probably start crying here. God bless him. He was a stock boy at Publix. And we got the general manager, not of the store, but of the entire area of Florida to come in and testify. He sucks as a stock boy, but we love him and we're never letting him go. He's impaired. He just, he needs help. And that's what won that case. So in the brain injury case, it is the family. It is the coworkers. It is the church uh, people that they know at church. It is the little league part. It's the people that know this is not the right, this is not the same guy. And God bless him, they got it. And so, I mean, he could have, when I say, here's my impression of him on the stand. Well. I remember I was driving down the street. I mean, the point being, a jury could have very much disbelieved him and said he's putting on. But it was through these other witnesses that they realized they ruined this guy's life. And we got him four and a half you know, million dollars. As far as the, let me tell the Sacketator story. So you talk about how to make these things real. Great question. How to make the jury feel the pain of somebody they don't know. That can be a hard task. And so I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know the answer to this question until it actually happened in trial. I've learned my lesson since. But when I was a young lawyer, I told in preparing my client, I told him when it comes to um, loss of enjoyment of life, those are activities of life that we can no longer enjoy to the degree that we used to. It's different than mental anguish, different than pain and suffering. Doesn't mean we can't do them anymore. It means we can't enjoy them to the degree that we used to because of our injuries. Do you have it? You're going to need to give me some anecdotal testimony, meaning, because he doesn't know what anecdotal testimony is, meaning you got to tell me some stories about how it works in your life. And my God bless, I hope he doesn't see this. My client was uh, bald with the, the long hair down the back, back and the long ZZ top type uh, 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 chin beard going. Uh, and was country as a corn nicest man ever. But so I gets to that point of the of the questioning. And I said, you know, what on this uh, activities of daily living that you no longer enjoy, can you kind of help the jury understand what you're talking about? And he go, and I didn't know what the answer was. That's the only thing I knew. I didn't know anything else was coming but that. And he goes, Well, there ain't no more sack of taters. I'm like, oh shit. I just made the number one cardinal error. I just asked a question. I don't know the answer to. 
and now I'm in. I can't. So I got to go with it, right? Okay, what's sack of taters? And my sphincter is like this because uh, I have no idea what's coming. And he said, well, my boys are now 10 and 13. And when they were two and four, they, I'm sorry, yeah, two and five, whatever the math is, their mother ran out of us. And so it's just been me and my boys and they're smarter than I'll ever be. And his voice started to break. He said, they're my heroes. And we have a, a, a thing that we do every day, which is they come home, they do their homework and God bless them. I can't help them because they're just smarter than me. Um, and after they do their homework, they watch TV, they go play, we have dinner together. And when it's time for bed, I used to be able to go to the bottom of the stairs and I would say, just yell out at the top of my voice, sack and taters. And one of them would come running up and I'd hold him up and he had a neck injury along with his brain injury. Uh, uh, and, and I said, he had a fusion actually, and I'd hold him, uh, one on my, uh, one shoulder and my other son on my other shoulder. And I'd march him up the stairs. He was doing this in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, witness stand and I'd march him up the stairs and I'd throw one down on his bed and give him a big kiss good night and I'd throw the other down on his bed and give him a big kiss good night and he goes ever since this crash there ain't there ain't no more sack of takers heavy wow <laughs> nobody's that smart nobody can make that shit up and yet it's true for every single uh, uh, client that we represent you just got to care enough to, to, to probe and get them to tell you their reality, get them to tell you their truth, uh, because they all have it. We all do. We all, it's part of life is, is having joys and, and dreams and aspirations and also tragedies and being able to talk about what, how they, uh, how they affect us. So that sack of taters, I cry every time, sorry for being emotional, but I cry every time I tell it to my clients because it's the greatest example of what anecdotal testimony is. Tell me a story. Don't tell me it hurts. Tell me how it affects you. Tell me how it hurts. It's like a, 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 a I had a, a, on a knee case, I won 7 million bucks very early on where my client's ankle came up and touched his uh, ear tore his knee all up and he said it was like 2000 bee stings happening all at the same time. Everybody's got their own, you know, uh, reality of what it is. And it's just that we can't make, even if we wanted to make up uh, a way to explain it, we can't do it as well as they can. Let them do it. And few lawyers can do it as well as you can. And maybe that's why the insurance companies are all afraid of you. And those that aren't afraid of you probably aren't very happy when you file your appearance and they find out that they're going to be trying a case against the great Rick Block, the rock star. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm sorry you couldn't be here in the studio with me today, Rick. Where does this podcast find you today? I am in Los Angeles in, in West Hollywood, California, uh, where I, I uh, we now have an office here in Los Angeles, but I don't work that much uh, Calif many California cases. I come out here to kind of decompress and get ready for the next set of trials. Of course, you live in L.A. with all the other rock stars. <laughs> Rick, it's been a great journey with you today. It's um, some, some really rare air, and I know our listeners are really going to benefit from learning about the man behind the name. Thank you so much. Well, let me say this. Yep. I've known Russell Adler since he was in high school. He's a good man. Uh, count me in for any other way I can help. I'm happy to do it. Okay. So just let me know when John Morgan can join me, and uh, I'm going <laughs> to ask you to find me some other really wonderful, prominent, and interesting lawyers because that's my challenge, to find my next great guest. But you're going to be a tough one to top, Rick Block. Thank you so much for joining us. Have yes, a great sir. day, and I uh, hope to run into you next time I'm out there in L.A. Come on over. Goodbye. Thank you You got so it. Much. All right. Bye -bye. And uh, so that wraps this episode of the Interesting Lawyers Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.